Thank you very much. It is amazing to be here with you all uh, to share with you about uh, flipped learning and how flipped learning can transform education. I have really enjoyed the last few days here in uh, Sevilla. Uh, I got a chance to see some of the sights. I went for a quick jog. And one thing I did yesterday is I got a chance to visit the classroom of Juan Pablo Mora. And Juan Pablo Mora has flipped his university classroom. And we can see a bit of, a, uh, of his class. This is shot yesterday. His students were debating the issue of the the uh, uh, Catalonia issue here in Spain. They were passionate, and he had totally flipped his class. It was an amazing experience meeting these young people and watching their passion. So I start with a few questions. Can you hear it? Have you seen it? Have you felt it? I'm talking about that churning, shaking feeling, that unstable feeling beneath the feet of every educator, that the foundation of education, my friends, is shifting. Now, this foundation is not new. The foundation of education has been shifting back and forth for decades, if not centuries. We've been wrestling with questions such as, can all students learn? Questions such as, what should be taught and how should we teach it? Questions such as, what is good teaching and how do we teach others how to teach well? What should we keep in education and what should we fix? As David just said, what's the purpose of school? Which education initiative should we keep and which one should we just let pass? We've been wrestling with this question for well over 100 years. And that's what's not new, but there are some things that are new. So what is new? I think number one is there's now a growing impatience for anemic results. In the higher education space, college is becoming too costly. And people are even asking the question, why should I even go to college? And frankly, too little learning is happening in tertiary institutions across the world. Here's a couple of stats. Do you know that 45% of students did not demonstrate significant improvement in learning in their first two years of college? And then 36% after four? And maybe you're like this guy, and you're a frustrated professor. The dynamic of higher education has changed. And let's also be honest, our students have changed as well, haven't they? They're more technically savvy. And it used to be that you could just close your door and teach however you wanted, but now there's Rate My Professor. And you're, you're fighting to make sure that you get on the top of that list. And now, of course, in higher education, everybody has a voice. You can have a voice on social media. Some of these voices are voices that haven't been heard, and that's good. And some of the voices maybe shouldn't be heard, but anybody can have a voice. And of course, there's now global competition. Universities across the world are trying to say, how can I stack up against uh, the other university? And not to mention the issue of completion. My stats say that of students who enroll in four-year institutions don't complete. And as much as 80% at two-year institutions. This is data in the U.S. And technology has significantly changed the way we teach. There's a growing complexity, not only in our institutions of higher ed, but also just in our society. And as, as, as David well said, the pace of change has just been significant. This all spells, and David, you said this well, this all spells that we are living in a disruptive world, a world where everything is being disrupted, including education. And I want to say this, folks, the future of education 
is going to be different from the past. And let's, let's talk about disruption for a moment. What is disruption? Here's my definition. It's when everybody agrees there's a better way. For example, lighting. There's a better way. Communication. It's been disrupted. Transportation has been disrupted. How we access movies has been disrupted. How we purchase travel has been disrupted. All right, anybody in here under 30 years old? Who's under 30? I got a few hands. All right, this next image you're not going to understand. Okay, um, this is how we used to get music. Okay, on the left, we used to have to go to this place called a record store. You guys remember the record stores? Anybody admit that they still have their record collection? Yeah, okay. That, but anyways, <laughs> how we read the news has been disrupted. How we read text has been disrupted. What about education? Here's an image from 1917. 2017. Not a lot of change. Even more fascinating, do you realize that if you look all over the world, that if you looked at classrooms everywhere across the world, they would, number one, look amazingly similar, and number two, they would look the same as they did 100 years ago? Don't believe me? Do what I did, and Google the word classroom and pick a country. This is what classrooms look like in the US, in Japan, in Nigeria, in Afghanistan, in Russia, in Korea, in Pakistan, in the Middle East, in Eastern Europe, in the Himalayan mountains, in Vietnam, in Brazil, in Iran, in rich countries, in developing countries, in the military, in prison, <laughs> in business, and in higher ed. Three questions. Number one, how is it that countries all over the world that differ in religion, race, culture, geography, classrooms look the same? What's up with that? Number two, why is it that so many of these classrooms look similar to the classrooms of 100 years ago? And number three, when we look at these classrooms, what are we seeing? What makes them so recognizably similar? You know what it is? We are trying to open up the minds of our students and just pour information in their heads. Folks, it's 2017. Really? Really? We are in the 21st century and we're still doing that? You don't believe me? Let's look at a meta study done in the US of 2 million US classrooms. Now this is K-12 data, all right? K-12 data, Dr. Robert Marzano studied 2 million classrooms asking the question, what instructional style is being used? He found that 58% of class time was being used for lecture. That is from kindergarten through year 12. And when you segment the data, the older the students, the higher the number got. My guess is if you walked into your institutions of higher education, that number is not 58%, it's 88%. Why? It's, why? it's because we have adopted passive learning as opposed to active learning. Folks, I don't want to spend the time trying to explain to you and share with you mind-numbing stats about why active learning is better than passive learning. For those who still believe passive learning is better, you're going to be the old curmudgeon who's going to just say, well, it's the best way. We've always done it that way. And for those of you who believe in active learning, you're just going to continue to wring your hands and say, why don't they adopt my model? So what I want to do is I want to fast forward and give you a news flash. I've spent the last, oh, I'd say seven or eight years traversing the globe, just in the last few years, 700,000 miles, almost a million kilometers, traveling on the world, helping schools and teachers move from passive to active learning. And David, you said this well, I'll use a different term. I think we're at the inflection point. 
in the history of education where we need to move from passive to active learning. All over the world, people are realizing that we've reached a critical mass and that the traditional model is dead. All over the world, we've realized that a classroom that looks like this is never better than a classroom that looks like that. All over the world, those who have moved from passive to active learning have said they could never go back. That's why I believe that the most significant and the most transformative thing that we can do in our institutions is to move from passive to active learning. And the big takeaway of this, and David, I think again you said this, this is interesting how we connect, is that I want to say it's time. It's time for us to realize that the future of education needs to be different from the past. It's time to realize that passive learning as a methodology needs to go the way of the dodo bird. It's time to be honest with ourselves to say that the education system is broken. It's broken. My friends, it is a broken system and unless we make the changes, it won't work. So if we, if we have a broken system and we need to lay a new foundation, I'm going to argue this new foundation needs to be laid upon three key principles. They all start with a P. The first one is that we need a model that is pragmatic. It must be something that just works. You know, when Steve Jobs, we saw some images of him earlier, when Steve Jobs went to his designers and said, I want you to design a new phone. Now remember the phone that had dominance at that day was the Blackberry with its 10,000 buttons or whatever it was, right? And he says, you get to have one button. And we know the answer. We need something that is pragmatic and just works. Number two, we need to be honest with ourselves and be willing to have what I'll call plain talk. Okay? Plain talk is being willing to have courageous conversations with each other, with our faculties. And I think this quote from Douglas Reeves is powerful, that a culture of no friction means that the real discussions take place in the parking lot and not in the professional learning communities. So number one, we need a pragmatic solution. Number two, we need one that has a plain talk. And number three, may seem surprising, we need to return to the pedagogies of the past. Now, I'm not talking about the old school passive learning model. I'm talking about the old, old school. This is the models of Confucius and Socrates, who in the fifth century BC believed in a more personalized and individualized educational model, where students were more about asking questions instead of having knowledge poured into their head. And to simplify the history of education, let's fast forward to the 1800s and Horace Mann, who brought compulsory education to the state of Massachusetts. But when he was operating in the, in the 1800s, he was influenced by the industrial model. And that is where the industrial model of education came from, folks. That's the old school, the industrial model. But folks, we don't live in the industrial model. We in the post-industrial era. And in the post-industrial era, we need students who can solve problems. Not just solve problems, but find problems. Yes, folks, we need to return to the old, old school. We need to find a way where we can scale the Confucius and Socratic models. But how can we do that? How can we personalize that for everybody? How can we move away from a one-size-fits-all education model? We need to stop the factory. Let's watch a video and see if this sheds some light on this premise. And the effects could cost up to a billion dollars. Homeowners are watching their concrete basement walls crumble, putting their houses at risk of collapse and what could be a wake-up call for people everywhere. Oh, my God. And this has probably happened in the past year. The middle of the night sound was the walls of the basement splitting. You can see outside. In some places, wide open. 
Mind you, you worry tonight the house is going to come down on top of you? I do, I worry. I do worry. How do you sleep? I like to talk. There is a fix, lifting the home completely off the foundation and pouring a new one. For the Paracchios who raised four children here, the price tag is more than $200,000, nearly 60% the value of their home. On top of the emotional pain, this family and many like them face financial ruin, and there's little hope of a quick solution. Stephanie Goss, NBC News, Wellington, Connecticut. 30 years ago, they poured foundations for these homes, and there was an impurity in the concrete, and they were destined to crumble and fail. I believe that's what we've done in our educational system. The, you know what we've been doing in education? We've been fixing up the kitchen. We've been painting the bathroom. Meanwhile, the foundation is crumbling beneath our feet. You know, let's take this one. We've been buying interactive whiteboards, right? I'm thinking that's going to solve education. We've been de buying devices. It's not worked. If we need to build a new foundation upon what should we build that foundation, I'm going to give you six key things. Number one, it should be support mass personalization. Number two, it should prepare students for the uncertain future versus the rapidly disappearing past. Number three, it should be flexible enough to deal with the rapid change. Number four, it should allow us to keep what we know and toss out what doesn't. Number five, it should be based on the active learning that encourages students to take more ownership of their learning. And number six, it should support the development of world-class teachers and learners. So does a model like this exist? Is there a model that works? The answer is yes. It's flipped learning. I've got good news to you. Flipped learning is working and it fits all of these criteria. Some of you may, most of you have heard of flipped learning, I imagine, you know, but let me just in one minute explain. The idea of flipped learning is we want to move inf information transfer out of the group space and put it into the individual space because most of classrooms spends most of their time on the easy stuff from Bloom's taxonomy, the, the remembering and understanding, and we send them home to do the more difficult tasks, the application, the analysis, the evaluation, and the creation. But what if instead we flipped Bloom's taxonomy and we spent more class time on the more difficult cognitive tasks? And frankly, as I think, and in my latest book, I talk about this, I think the best shape of Bloom's taxonomy is actually a diamond. In a diamond, what we want to do is we want to spend the bulk of our class time at the application and the analysis levels. And folks, that's really what flip learning is. You see, folks, flip learning is the future. Or you might think of it this way. You know, it's the easy button. We need an easy way, a simple model that moves educators from passive to active learning. This last year, I spent uh, studying flipped learning. We studied flipped learning, and I realized that there were some things that I, you know, one of the pioneers, didn't know about flipped learning. I came up with five key things that I didn't know. And I want to be honest with you, is that as I was doing this, I realized this quote from J. Paul Getty, in times of rapid change, experience could be your worst enemy. And that was me. I, I thought I knew. So the five things that we realized that we didn't know, number one, is that flip learning is not static. There's a view out there that flip learning is that thing with the videos, or maybe it's this quote, I know all about flipped classrooms. I read John and Aaron's first book and attended a conference session. Instead, we found that flip learning is changing dramatically. And the reason it's changing dramatically is number two, it's evolving because of three factors. Number one, it's evolving because of research. Number two, classroom innovation. And number three, technology. It keeps iterating and changing. It's changing. The research, by the way, used to be the questions being asked in the flipped 1.0 era, if you will, is are the students happy, are the teachers happy, and are the test scores going up? Now they're asking questions more like what one of our research fellows at the Flip Learning Global Initiative says, Dr. Kuo Jin from Taipei, he says, instead of asking the question, does flip learning work, let's ask the question, how do we improve on the model? 
Number two, classroom innovation. We're seeing how the classroom is used and becoming more active strategies and what those active strategies keep changing and iterating. Uh, I learn new things every day as I talk with uh, researchers and the, and the teachers around the world. And third, of course, technology is rapidly changing and the technology available to us just exponentially increases. And in fact, a number of companies have come alongside the global initiative to work with us to build, build the best technology possible. So, Flip learning is evolving because of research, because of classroom innovation, and because of technology. So number one, flip learning is not static. Number two, it's evolving because of three factors. And number three, flip learning is emerging as a global movement. I mean, the fact that you guys are from as many countries as you are speaks to it. We have seen flip learning uh, accelerating across six continents. And in fact, here's six hotspots. We're standing in one of the hotspots right now. In Spain, the Ministry of Education has said we want to help support flipped learning. It is growing significantly. In fact, the FlipCon Spain, a flipped class conference Spain, is sponsored by the Ministry of Education. And I'll just highlight one other. In Argentina, the state or the province of Misiones has decided to flip their entire province. We're seeing these kinds of adoptions across the world. So number one, flipped learning is evolving, or is not static. Number two, it's evolving because of three factors. Number three, it's a global movement. Number four, it's providing new opportunities. There's not a day go by that I don't hear from somebody who's essentially getting a new job because of flipped learning. We're seeing a need for experienced flipped learning teachers, flipped learning leadership, flipped learning trainers, flipped learning researchers, flipped learning authors and speakers. So flip learning is creating new opportunities. And probably the most significant thing, the most important thing I want to get to you is this number five, that there is now a new awareness about flipped learning. This is the sort of the big statement. We've discovered that flipped learning is not just another teaching strategy, but rather a meta strategy that supports all others. What does that mean? Think of it this way. I think a lot of people think of flipped learning as just one of many options. Project-based learning, cooperative learning, master learning, flipped learning, pick one. But instead, it should look more like this. Where flipped learning leads to the other. At the Flipped Learning Global Initiative, we've been uh, just, uh, we we started publishing some books and uh, the newest book that's soon to come out is on flipped project-based learning. And how the, 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 the teacher who wrote this and collaborated with a bunch of other teachers across the world, he is saying, I could have never done project-based learning had I not had the time that flipped learning provided. So it is that meta strategy that supports all others. Or to use a different metaphor, we could use a metaphor that was developed by Dr. Robert Talbert, um, one of the uh, flipped learning uh, researcher fellows. And he said this, think of flipped learning as the operating system of a device. So my phone is iOS. That's the operating system, but I use different apps, right? So he said, flip learning is the operating system, the new foundation of our educational system, but the apps are things like these active learning strategies, projects, inquiry, cooperative learning, peer instruction. And If you didn't realize this, flipped learning is not new. It's been going on for at least 11 years, and you could even trace it back further. And it's happening in diverse subjects, from medicine to engineering to law to science to math to agriculture to everything else. It's being used at the biggest institutions in the world. Do you realize that Harvard Medical School has flipped? Professors are flipping all over the world. I'm sure some of you here in this room have flipped your class. Flipped learning. I believe is the answer. Let let me close with a couple thoughts here. A while back, a friend of mine asked me five really tough questions. He asked me this, if flip learning is so great, why isn't everyone flipping their classroom? Number two, he said, why are we accepting passive learning in any school? We know that it's not creating self-directed world-class learners. Number three, why are we encouraging or enabling students to avoid owning their learning and setting them up to be ill-prepared for the demands of the future? These bothered me, people. Number four, why should we allow tradition, ego, school culture, or conflict avoidance to override what is most effective and best for students? And number five, hit me the most. 
Why are we being casual about what any other profession might label? Now practice. This led me to a personal and professional crisis. I realized that I've been spending my time focusing on teaching teachers how to flip classes, when instead we need to think much bigger, much, much bigger. How do we flip schools? How do we flip institutions? How do we flip countries? And then I began to think about my own family. Think about your own family for a moment. This is my family, my, my children and my uh, my, my son's also married, so it's got a, a, our family. What kind of education did I want for my own kids? My, all my kids are in university or graduate school right now. Do I want them to sit in passive learning? Absolutely not. But I hear from my own children, yeah, I got this professor, Dad, and all he does is stand up there and yap. Please, come help them to flip their class. Or let's take this to, to a metaphor of, of medicine. You understand in medicine, we talk about this idea of, you know, do no harm. If, if let's say that, David, you, you found the, your doctor and you found the cure of cancer. It's awesome, cool. And I say, and I'm a doctor too, and I say, well, that, that might work for your patients, but you know what, I, I don't really want to tr- try that method out. <laughs> You'd sue me for malpractice if you were my patient. You should too. Or the story of James Lancaster, you may know the story, James Lancaster, 1601, he had four ships, they went from um, England to, uh, to uh, India, and he had all the people on his ship take two sips of lime juice, on the other ships, nobody got any lime juice, on his ship, nobody died, on the other ships, 110 people died. You've heard of that, of course, that's a classic story, medical story about scurvy. But do you realize they discovered that? He shared that with the British Navy. You know how long it took for the British Navy to um, make this a mandate that they'd take some lime juice? It took 194 years. Talk about a slow pace of growth. We don't want to be that. And it also was estimated that one million sailors across the world died of scurvy between that time. The bottom line is, we've decided that if it is possible to have this kind of a classroom be adopted across the world in a relatively short period of time, then it's possible to get them to look more like this if we can accelerate the change. Why? Why? Because, folks, it's time. It's time, my friends, to realize that we can take the things that are impossible and make them possible. It is now possible to solve some of the biggest issues in the world of education. Now, I know that you here represent the 80% or the 20% who do 80% of the work. You are the people who spent time to come to this conference. You really are the change agents. And my hat comes off to you that you came here to do that work. But I want to push you a bit, and I want to expand your vision. Because you might be asking, John, well, where do I start? Where do I start in this journey? I'm going to give you eight starting points. Number one, get the best flipped training. We have found people who have done a poor job flipping. In fact, one of the research uh, papers recently said that flip learning is an easy method to get wrong. Number two, you need to find the simplest technology. So, so often, we've tried to make it this complex Folks, this is an easy method. Number three, we need to find solutions that are common to the problems of flippers across the world. Number four, and actually by being here, you're doing number four, you need to get out of the silos and connect with like-minded flippers around the world through social media, through meeting face-to-face like you are here. Number five, we need to keep up with the best flipped practices across the world. Number six, we need to validate, or we encourage you to validate your flipped knowledge through certification. There are certification programs that we offer. You need to build your flipped learning resume. And number eight, you need to share your experiences with the global community. In fact, we are so committed at the Flip Learning Global Initiative to you is that what we want to do is we want to give you an opportunity and give you a preview of our flipped learning certification program. All you have to do is to go to flipiceri17.com, fill out the form, and we'll get back to you. Go to flipped. Uh, it's also, by the way, on the paper, the handout that you have there at the bottom, you'll see that. I think it's missing the dot com, but that you get the idea. Folks, we are in a 
crazy point in the history of education where walls may be going up on the southern border of the United States, (laughs) but walls are going down all over the world. Do you realize that I I visited a classroom in in, in Tenerife, in the Canary Islands, and they are... They are working with uh, Elon Musk and SpaceX, this small school, and they're launching satellites into space. These things are happening. David, you talked about this. These things are happening across the world. Folks, the future of education is going to be different from the past, and whether or not you are a part of that, well, it's up to you. Peter Drucker may have said it best when he said, if you want something new, you got to stop doing something old. We need to return to the old, old school and abandon the old school. Thank you very much.